welcome to the Mind Speak interview series. Obviously, I'm Elaine Powell, and today I'm so excited to have Beju Solanke in the hot seat with me today. I've known Beju, I think it's how many, I think maybe about five years. Yeah, five, six years. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, from a um, personal development course. But I think our paths crossed every now and again. We spoke, but yeah, yeah. it's definitely since Clubhouse that I feel I've got to know you a, a, a lot better. A little bit more, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. How are you finding the Clubhouse world right now? Well, it's, well, for me, it's been a game changer, you know, reconnecting with people that I already knew, making some fantastic great friends. But the the, the power of the voice and the, the the ability to to build trust in a very, very short space of time where they are willing to exchange personal messages through Instagram. And then whether that that turns into collaborations, partners or even clients is 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 nothing, nothing like I've seen in them before. You know, I said to people before that. You know, spending uh, six weeks on Clubhouse is the equivalent in terms of building trust a year on LinkedIn. Now, some might argue, well, did you use LinkedIn properly? Well, that's a different that's a different equation. But uh, um, yeah, it's been it's been fantastic. It's been fantastic. But now it's been you know it need to be more strategic. Otherwise, it can be a complete time suck. And uh, that's that's not. Yeah, good. yeah. I'm really interested to, to hear your story because I've heard lots of people's story, Kimberly King, Marcus Black, uh, Victoria Winterford. So, you know, it's that kind of, why do you do what you do? Mm. What is it that had you, um, yeah, just just get into helping people in such an uh, you know, incredible and impactful way. So Beju, what's your story? What's my story? Well, way, way back when, you know, when you're growing up, you think that uh, you don't have a choice. You know, it, it was coming from an Indian background. There's only really the opportunity to be either a doctor or a dentist, a shopkeeper or a pharmacist. And that's about it. And you don't even contemplate anything outside of those choices. So going to uni wasn't like an if, but a, but a, but a, but a when uh, and what, if you like. And I didn't do very well in my level. So I eventually ended up doing some math stats computing degree. And uh, because I thought, well, that would be my access to be an accountant if that's what we're supposed to do. And no real desire. Anyway, during the first year, I found this book in the library, the World Library, and we went to the library. And I started reading this book, and I couldn't put it down. And the book was all about body language. This is fascinating. And that sort of sparked my interest on psychology. So long story short, I transferred. I stopped that degree, and I went on to do a psychology degree. And... Um, I got married quite young, so I, I met my wife, who's now my ex-wife, uh, when I was 19. And uh, so that was like my second year of uni. So I got my degree in psychology. My first proper job was as a psychology lecturer. I was like, wow. And there was a, the reason I got it was like in the new, local newspaper, it said psychology lecturer, part-time lecturer, associate lecturer it's called. So basically you pay per hour. It was a cover, um, uh, cover maternity leave or something, I don't know. And it already said it was psychology degree essential everything else desirable I said well I've got a psychology degree so I applied for it and I got it and basically it was just like it was like 14 pound an hour thought, wow that's been a fortune but you realize you only get power paid for the time you teach someone it doesn't include the prep time the mark the marking time and all the rest of it and by the time you do that you realize you're paying like three quid an hour but that's a different story mm -hmm. so I started being a psychology lecturer within sort of four or five months I um, got the opportunity to be a full-time lecturer so I ended up teaching there for four years and I loved it. I didn't realize I loved, I love the, I love when you're working with someone, a student, and then they get this light bulb moment and they think, wow. And um, I thought, okay, but I wanted to be a sports psychologist. So I took a master's in sports psychology and I finished the master's, but I hadn't finished the dissertation. And I thought with the, if you, if anybody's in FE, I was teaching in FE, if you know anything about FE is the more high you up, higher rank you go in FE, the less teaching you do more administration. And also you start, finding yourself wearing corduroy jackets and when you start wearing corduroy jackets you get institutionalized and when you get institutionalized there's no getting out so i thought i've got to get out so i i left that to finish my masters and i thought i need a part-time job or just an interim job and i found this sales job in london so i got this job in london uh sales job right uh, i'll be there for four or five months and then i'll leave and go and do my phd now, the sales job was dealing with universities who want to recruit international students. Now, the good thing about that was that our target, the target audience I was speaking to was university lecturers, deans of colleges, those sort of people. So me coming from an academic background, 
I was like, sales is like for scummy people, you know, you don't do sales if you can't do anything else. And I've got a degree for kind of, I have a degree in psychology, you know, you know, I, I should be saying quite, and uh, produce it quite highbrow. And my mum was like, very much like, this job you got, you do need your degree, don't you? I said, yes, mum, we do need a degree. So what I used to do is we used to book appointments at universities. I didn't hate to be in the office. Now, when I was booking these appointments, I used to go to these universities and not say I was, I was like, I'm an educational consultant, right? And didn't talk anything about the product. And what, I, what was happening is I, did, I had no sales training, but what was occurring, because I was going and saying I was interested in their courses and we were, we were helping them recruit international students. So we had marketing packages for that. So I was, I was interested in their courses, where they got students from, not wanting to sell anything, just listening. And then naturally they said, so, so how do we do this then, Beige? What do we need to do? I said, well, we can have a, a page in this magazine. We can go to that fair and we can do This is before internet. And, oh, okay, we'll do that then. I used to sell some really big deals. Go back to the office. Now, what are you doing? I said, don't know. Just having a chat with them. And they're saying they sign up to a product. So, and I've got one really big deal the day after, no, week after I, I got my master's. So I thought, oh, and I earned more in one week than I did in three months teaching. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, this is really good. I know what I'm going to stay here for a few more months. And when he goes pear-shaped, because in sales, if you don't perform, you just get sacked. I'll go and do my master's. I ended up being there for nine years. <laughs> the travel, the, the money, the, the autonomy. And I had a young family. I just had my second child when I started that sales job. Mm -hmm. And you just realize actually life's good at the moment. And why do I want to settle that? Because I've got a young family. You know, my wife was a nurse, so she was, she was working full time. But, you know. So, and I thought one day, one day I'll leave. And by the time that one day came to leave to do my sports psychology, I was two out of the game. And then in 2001, 2000, 2001, this thing called coaching came into the UK. Yeah. Coaching Academy. Um, I yeah, so I was, I, was, I was a member of the second cohort ever. Yeah. Right? And I took this coaching course, free coaching course. And I found that, Coaching was this practical application of everything I learned in psychology. The thing with psychology is quite a dry subject. Psycho all psychology is you either proving or disproving a hypothesis. That's all you do in psychology. That's all you do. It's all about statistical analysis. Is it statistically um, uh, likely this is to happen as opposed to from a, a randomness? And then you realize all those psychology taught me about how humans behave. It didn't talk, teach me anything about how to use that in an everyday life. And coaching mm -hmm. did. So I thought, wow, I want to be a coach. And I'll, you know, Pete Cohen, who's a, who we know on Clubhouse, but he used to be on TV then. He used to be on breakfast TV doing coaching and stuff. And at that time, Oprah was, well, she's massive now, but she had a show. And she had a guy called Dr. Phil Gray. Yeah. And so between Dr. Phil Gray, the life strategist, and Pete Cohen, I, thought, I want to be them. I want to be one of them, right? And, and it took me another five years to talk and not walk. And what the, what the seminal point was, was I was in New York on a business trip, 2005, six, I think it was. I was about to close one of the biggest deals the company and I had. And I went to this meeting, it's supposed to be a four or five hour meeting. Within 45 minutes, the people are saying, right, purchase order number. And I thought, mm. so it's basically a confirmation meeting, got the deal. Went back to the hotel before mobile phones. Phoned the office and I said, um, got the deal. Oh, I paid you well done, blah, blah, blah. So you know what? Take a week off in New York, do what you want to do on the on the on the on the company. And for three seconds I was ecstatic. For, you know, and then I thought, is this it? Is this what my life's about? I've all right, I've made some money, but I've made my boss more money. Yeah. And I thought, I don't want this to be my legacy. I don't want this. I said, Paige, why aren't you doing what you want to do? And the flight from London to from New York to London, I wrote down all the reasons why I hadn't done my own thing. And then, then I went, then I said, which of these reasons is bullshit made up in my head and which are genuine? And every not good enough, bullshit. Wrong <laughs> colour, bullshit. Um, I'm not tall enough, bullshit. Uh, people won't love me, bullshit. Uh, the sky's sky's blue, bullshit. It's not sunny. All these reasons. I haven't got, you know, and the only reason that was genuine was actually pragmatic reason. Would I be going from the frying pan into the fire? I money. If mm -hmm. I left a well-paid job 
and I've got I had three kids then wife house all the all the all the bits am I going to set myself a failure so then I went back went to loads of workshops as you do spoke to a few people and the 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 the, the vibe I was getting back from people was this you need to have six to 12 months put away if you wait till you're financially free it's never going to happen so what's your risk averseness oh so what's true. your risk averseness right yeah so you've got to work out what works for you. There's no right rule. So I worked out, right, six months. I need six months put away. So I did a bit of property. I was fortunate. I joined a few property groups, learned how to buy property um, to ensure that I make money when I buy property. And I bought three or four properties. And then I remember November the uh, November the 14th, 2007, uh, I got my solicitor, rang me saying, this property has been transferred. So now the money's in the bank. So out of all my excuses, the one excuse now was eliminated. <laughs> so literally in that moment, because I, I wrote my resignation, I went in and handed him my notice. Yeah. And the director sort of knew, he knew it was coming, but he was surprised at the timing, October, because why don't you just hang around till Christmas? There's bonuses, this, that. I said, I could do, but then it'll be Easter. Mm. And then there'll be the summer. And there'll be something else. So I've got to do it. So that was it. I left and I've fortunately not looked back. And I've been coaching and training and loving it ever since wow i love i love your story how incredible i feel like each element of our past leads us on to the next thing and on to the next thing and on to the next thing like there's nothing left there's nothing no waste mm. there's you know the experience you've had in sales measurably is now helping you or supporting you in yeah. your business yeah. which is sales and marketing people say <laughs> Uh, do you wish you rest earlier? Yes, I did. If wish I did leave earlier, but everything happens for the right reason. I wouldn't have the corporate experience. That wouldn't allow me to get into some corporate gigs I'm getting now because I've had that corporate experience. So yeah, there's always the right time. I let you know if 37 I left to start my business. And there's people here who are 25, 30 year olds think they've missed the boat. And I've been until 37 for crying out loud. So you know, so that was 13 years ago, and you can work that out. Oh, you only look like it was a few years. <laughs> so look, I, I, I can see the, the progression to, to kind of going into coaching and jumping from a salaried bonus job into your, how did that, there's that a bit of a bridge there that I'd love to hear about. How did you um, create that bridge into, you know, creating a successful coaching business? Well, it was, it was like, well, you've got to get on with it. The thing is, I wasn't made redundant. I wasn't sacked. So it was my choice. I left the job. So I couldn't blame. I couldn't say, well, I wasn't ready. You know, they sacked me at the wrong time or I was made redundant. So I have to deal with that trauma and rejection. I left. I left the job. I paid job, traveled around the world. The job gave me everything apart from did feed my soul. So then it was just a question, well, you've got to get on with it. And it, it took the time, you know, you network and through networking, you know, social media just started getting into it. Facebook was just there, Twitter, but it wasn't, you didn't really get business from those platforms then. So it was literally hardcore, you know, uh, lever going into BNI meetings and all the other networking meetings and just doing what you do. And gradually, and I remember it was month five, I got my first contract. It was a school where they wanted me to coach all the senior leaders. And uh, that was my first paying gig. And not look, uh, in the first five years, I won Business Man of the Year within three years of starting my business. Now, I, I know I won that, not through business acumen, just through sheer personality. Just literally, I just charmed them. I know I charmed them, right? And I'll say that with open arms. I don't, don't say that. And, and, um, and I won it. And I remember when I won the award, I walked walk, walk, up to get the award and I thought, I hope this is not a curse. And it turned out to be a curse, not from the point of view of any sort of like woo-woo, but my own foot off the pedal. So it took it easy a bit. And the thing with business is if you, when things are going well, is not the time to take your foot off the pedal. When things are going well, you, you double down, but I took my foot off the pedal. It's all right. It'd be all right. And then it's really hard to go going again. So for five years, so between 2007, 2010, 11, it was great. 2011 to 2016, 17, it was tough. I was like, it was, I always felt like I was playing catch up. You know, when I thought I got a breakthrough, one step forward, two steps back. And it's all to do with my, my own mindset and lack of strategy, lack of understanding that, you know, putting things in place, investing in the business. I remember where I promised to, um, I promised that I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever jeopardize the house. So 
every time I earned something for business, I put it back into the house to making sure that was covered. And what I didn't do is invest in the business, which yeah, it was my fault, no one else's fault. And a lack of understanding, lack of awareness. Um, and you hear all these things about, you know, creating funnels and using websites and all the rest of it. It's only in the last three years I've been really doubling down and doing that. Again, should I have started that years ago? Of course I should have done. But again, everything, everything happens for a reason. And, uh, you know, it's all, you know, you're, everybody's one step too late to the party. Always, everybody wishes they started the day before. Mm. Uh, and that's what I love doing now. I love helping people make sure that they get out of their own way and making sure that they, uh, they do what they love. Yeah, no, I love that. Uh, and I heard that, you know, you got your first contract when you were all paid five months in. And for those three or four years, did you have a specific niche? What was your positioning? And has that changed uh, over time? Mm. It wasn't. My niche was pure accident because I, when I went networking at the start, I said, Where, how can I walk in and give credibility? I've not got paying clients. I've got no coaching practice. What can I say? So I looked at my background. I used to be a corporate sales director, so successful for nine years. And I used to be a psychology lecturer. So I just said, well, I'm a sales coach and a sales trainer. And then to get teaching gigs, I went to my local authority and I said, look, I'm available to help with schools. And they put me on this. There's a, there's a, there was a program called Aspiring Heads. And that program was about fast tracking deputies to become head teachers. And part of that training was to give them coaching support. So they put me as the lead coach on that program. And that's what I did. But as you did, as I did sales coaching, sales training in businesses, naturally my psychology stuff kicked in and I could help with leadership. I could help with team meetings. I could help with... Um, um, in, uh, retention and all these things so as the years went it evolved in terms of me becoming a performance psychologist so although I my my foot in the door was sales and I still do sales training and communication but it evolved into that and then taking advantage of the fact that I am a psychologist so I position myself as a performance psychologist I help anybody well I help entrepreneurs who are successful at what they're doing find the edge that's my niche now. So if you're already successful, I hope you find the edge in terms of um, uh, creating the game that you want. And when I talk about the game, it's the free game. It's my model. It's the, it's the game. It's the inner game, which is mindset. It's the game plan, which is strategy. And it's the outer game, which is um, taking action. And that's the model that I use. So when I work with individuals, it's like, well, are you, are you, are you top of your game? What's the game? Well, those three games work in conjunction. And that's what I use. Yeah, I love that because I think so many times when people are starting out they from what I've um, experienced, they, they don't want to niche. <laughs> they want to be everything to everybody. And as I say, you know, Tony Robbins didn't start out as everyone to everybody. I think he started out in phobias, but he really found his feet. And as you go out and you take action, you'll see, oh, these are the types of clients I want to work with. This is more the niche. You know, I suspect now over the years, you've decided to work with people who are already uh, performance based. They're already getting results versus those who are kind of stuck and, you know, still in that murky area of not sure what they're doing mostly because you, I guess you feel that you're more effective with people who are already driven and quite successful. Yeah. The thing with that is when you niche, it doesn't mean you would eliminate working with anybody else. And that's where people understand it. Niche comes from the Latin word that means nest. Ooh. So what niche means is nest is like, what's the nest you want to occupy in someone's brain when they think of you? So for you, you're a speaker coach. So you, what you, when someone thinks of Elaine, what you want, now when someone thinks of a speaker coach or a speaker expert, is you want to think of Elaine. That's the nest you want to occupy in someone's brain. So for me, when someone thinks of uh, working with entrepreneurs and finding the edge, I want them to think of me and up their game. So when I when, when we talk about niches, that's where it's like the center, but then you got other people around there who aspire to be that. So when they aspire to be that, when they aspire to be that, then they want to, uh, then they can relate to you. So it's understanding him. So niching doesn't mean you eliminate others. It means that's who you're talking to. And if those other people who don't meet your niche come to you, you can say, no, I don't work with you. Or you can explore that. You don't eliminate. You just make sure your messaging is, one, is for one person. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I also find that sometimes the market tells us what the, the need is and they also can pinpoint a niche that we can sit in because I feel on Clubhouse, what I've seen is uh, when you've coached people or when you've spoken, you, you've kind of got a couple of names that now stick. Obviously, there's the 
is it the Bayesianism? Uh, but yeah. are, are you the yeah. accountability sniper or something like that? What are the names well, you've been given? Well, the accountability coach and sniper, right? Yeah, and that, that is like, whoa, where's that come from, right? But the account, the thing is, well, my coaching style is very much about this, right? Is like, for me, it's like, well, what's going on in their story? What's the head? So when someone approaches me, if they've got a question or they've got, they're, they're looking for, or they, or we feel a coaching intervention is a, is a potential solution for them, is what I look at first. So what's the language they're using? Because the language determine their story in their head, right? Number one. So knowing the story, what's going on ahead, through that, you can say, okay, how do you lim- how do you start to eliminate? What's the antidote to the fear or the challenge around the story? The antidote is taking some action. Now that action could be within a strategy, or it could be a one-off action just to break the pattern. So my coaching style is right: identify what the issue is, ask them to see what the issue is, see what what's the utopia world they're looking for. Based on the utopia world they're looking for, what's the first step towards that? Now. What's stopping you taking that first step now? So I was doing that naturally on Clubhouse. I said, well, okay, because what happened was, and I'll say anything, someone comes, I've got a question. They get advice. Thank you for the advice. And that's it. All right, that's it. So then I went, I then come in and say, whoa, 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 whoa. So you got that advice. And sometimes you can hear the room go, mm. <laughs> it's like, right. So now you've got that. What's the one thing you're going to do? Oh, okay. So now make sure you come back next week and let me know. And then I just did it a few times. Before you know it, but, oh, oh, God, you've been bay I'm like, wow, okay, that's that's interesting. It's a compliment. And then uh, a few other people was, oh, he's the sniper. So the definition of a sniper is it hones in, takes fire, bang. And that's what I do. I hone into the issue behind the issue, ask the question, challenge them, get action. And then through the action, the thing is, when you take action, one of three things occur. There's any action. Number one, you get what you want or what you expect. Number two, you don't get what you want or what you don't expect. Or number three, a miracle. And most people don't get miracles because they're afraid of number two. They're afraid of what if this happens? What if that happens? So they don't take the action. Yeah. To so take the action. Now, if you take the action in the environment of a support system, you now have someone to rely on that if you do take action and there's a failure or you don't get what you want, you're not left alone and think, oh my God, I'm going to get in this cesspit of like um of, of failure and feel i'm not good enough and all the rest of it if you do take the action within the environment of accountability or support group or an individual you've got someone to lean on who's not emotionally attached to you and say well okay what actually happened there great let's go again okay what actually happened oh, it wasn't as good what did you learn and you the, the, the quicker you come out of that the easier it is now for some people they need to analyze it and and process it which is fine and it's, that's where you need to understand the human behavior in individuals. Some people need to process it. Some people need to take action. And it's understanding that. Yeah. Wow. So many golden nuggets in there, Beiju. <laughs> yeah. So as we kind of come near to the uh, end of the interview, I just want a few tips uh, that you would give in terms of speakers, because a lot of people are, um, are listening to this because they're aspiring speakers. And I know they it's hard for them to get themselves out of the way because they're inside their head, you know, with their narrative, their story um, about their nerves and being fearful. And yes, they can definitely um, apply everything you said so far, but is there anything in addition that you could share with the person listening? In terms of a speaker? Yeah. Getting up on the stage, performing despite their thoughts and their feelings. So again, when you get up on stage, there's a there's a thing around I'm performing, right? I'm delivering, whether it's a keynote or a masterclass or a seminar and some intervention. So you've got stuff coming out of your mouth that other people are going to listen to an action of. And when you make it all around that, naturally, you're going to feel nervous. You know, what is the second biggest fear is public speaking. And the reason is because they make it all about them, right? No, it's not about you. It's about the audience. It's about that individual, right? And this is the other thing I'll say to people is, you're not that important. (laughs) You are not that important. You're not. So get only to you. Only to you. (laughs) Get over to you. Get over yourself. If you go in and think, oh my God, I've got to perform. Get over yourself. Right? I promise you, you're not that important. So when you're, if you've been given a gift that allows you to express a message where someone's invited you to do a talk or whether you've created a scenario whereby you're talking to people, use that gift and wow, okay, it's my duty now to deliver right? Mm-hmm. Yes, you might have to polish up, you know, might have to use notes, PowerPoint or whatever, that's fine. 
but don't make it about you. Make it about the recipient. I would challenge anybody that anybody that goes to someone to a talk or a seminar and their intention is to hope they screw up. I hope this speaker screws up. No, they don't. What they usually go, what can I get from me? What can I get from this individual that's going to change my life? Whether they're forced to be there or whether it's on their own accord. Very rarely people go to somewhere thinking I'm looking at you to screw up. So they're not looking for you to screw up. You are thinking, are they, I hope I don't screw up, is far from the agenda. So when you turn up to speak, do what you need to do to prep, right? Get your, do your breathing right, make sure you get your notes, all the rest of it. But as soon as you're on stage, it's not about you. It's about the recipient and deliver. And you know what? If you screw up, you screw up. The audience do not know what you've missed out. They do not know. And actually, if you do screw up, nine times out of ten, they're empathetic with you. Yeah, definitely. Right? They, they seem because they're thinking, oh, my God, I'm glad I'm not in that situation. So, you know, and that might win you brownie points anyway. So don't make it about you. Always make it about the audience. And that's, that's in any context, whether you're doing a live speech, whether you're doing an Instagram live or a Facebook live or speaking on Clubhouse, the same principle applies. Delivering a podcast like this, it's not about me. It's about the, the recipient. Yeah. Uh, well, that's what I love with you, Beiju. No fluff. You just whoosh, go straight for it. It's not about you. You're not that important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some like it, some don't like it. So. Exactly. You'll find, uh, yeah, the tribe will be attracted to us and how we, um, how we are, and that's the right people to be with you on your journey. Mm. So let me ask you, Beju, uh, what's next for you? What are you up to? So what's next? Yeah, just you know, this year is about growing and doubling down on on the on the on the coaching business on Spirit Global. You know, we have had big plans last year for various reasons. Pandemic was part of the reason we've had to put some of those plans in the back burner, which we're re reigniting in 2022. So what we're doing 21 is just all about doubling down around. Um, I've got a number of accelerators. I've got an accelerator, which is a seven month program for entrepreneurs. I've got a mastermind we're launching, and it in Clubhouse is sort of given me this insight that people see me as this accountability coach but accountability is not just about what you're going to do when you're going to do it let me know there's a whole host of understanding the human behavior and coaching around that so we're launching that and and yeah and we've got um, uh, the thing about the game is understanding the inner game it's not just about mindset it's not just about strategy it's not about action it's all free so i've got a scorecard that allows you to determine how strong your game is so I don't know whether the link might be a part, part of this podcast is somewhere there or whatever, but if you take the score completely free, take the scorecard and then you get an opportunity, you get a report that tells you how strong your game is and how strong your inner game, your game plan and outer game. And it also gives you some tips, depending on the score, it gives you some tips about how to improve those games as well. Oh, I love that. Oh, well, I'm definitely going to be taking that myself. Cool. I'll share the results with you. Uh, so how can people keep in touch with you or find oh, you, Beju? Very fortunate to have a very unusual name. So if you, literally, if you Google my name, you'll find me all over Google. So Instagram, Clubhouse, I'm there quite often. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Yeah, so if you just Google my name, you'll find me anywhere. And actually, my, my number is in my LinkedIn profile on there, so you can WhatsApp me as well. It's very public. Oh, cool, cool. Well, Beju, it has been a pleasure hearing about your journey and there's so many golden nuggets inside your journey and, and many things myself and someone listening can take away for themselves as well and yeah I love what you're up to in the world you are incredible you're a giant and you have such a big heart and uh, I think we're really blessed to have someone like you uh, trailing trailblazing for others to follow Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you, Simon. And thank you for inviting me on your podcast. Really uh, honoured to do that. And hopefully the, your listeners and the people who are uh, listening to your podcast will get some value from this as well. I'm sure they will. So thank you so much for listening to the Mind Speak interview series. As always, you know, subscribe, like, uh, share, share comments. Both myself and Beju would love to hear from you. And I always leave the last word to my special guest. What would you like to share with the audience? Just listen, whatever you want to create in life, it's available to you on the other side of taking some action. And that action might be fearful. It might be uncomfortable. And it's fine. So find someone, find a friend, a resource, a coach, a mentor, someone that when, when you take the action, the odds are you probably won't get what you want. You probably will fail. That's okay. It's a learning in that. It makes sure you have a group of people around you that's going to hold you up. All right? So don't think, oh, how can I take an action so I don't fail? Probably expect to fail. 
So when you embrace that, don't attach yourself to the outcome. Focus on the process, trust the process, detach from outcome. That would be my final gambit. Oh, fabulous words to end on. Well, thank you very much. And from myself and Beju, we'll see you another time. Take, Take care. Bye-bye.